call to order the regular meeting of the Forest Hills School District uh, Board of Education, our March 23rd, 2015 uh, meeting. And before we even take the roll, I'm going to take just a minute, do something a little bit different, and read from our strategic plan, our vision, and our mission. Our vision is success for all students. Everything we do tonight should be focused on that. Our mission is to provide educational opportunities that enable our students to acquire the knowledge, skills, and personal qualities necessary for responsible citizenship and lifelong learning. Will the treasurer please call the roll? Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Here. Sorry. Here. Dr. Heiss? Here. Mr. Hemelgarn? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Repeat. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. My Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The exits to the room are obvious to your left, uh, the front of the room and the back of the room. And do we have a motion to adopt our agenda? So moved. Second. Mr. Tepper? Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Uh, approval of minutes of the special meeting of February 14th. Do you have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. This was a uh, work session we had, among other things, where we uh, worked on our priorities for the year. Mr. Tepper, please call the roll. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Uh, motion to approve the minutes of our regular meeting of February 23rd. Move to approve those minutes. Second. Mr. Tepper? Mr. Fruman? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Uh, we also had a special meeting March 19th. We don't have minutes for that yet, but I did want to uh, thank uh, the trustees and the park board for getting together for what I guess was called a historic meeting. I especially thank um, uh, trustee president Russ Jackson and also especially uh, Josh Gerth for his leadership in helping us pull that together. Uh, let's see, item number four, uh, correspondence. Uh, is the superintendent give you correspondence? Uh, yes, Mr. Smith and the board. I have two pieces of correspondence I'm very happy to share with the board this evening. The first of all, I just received this today, uh, as a matter of fact, that uh, uh, Forest Hill School District uh, uh, via the National Association of Music Merchants was named as one of the best communities for music education in the nation, uh, which is a phenomenal award. If you think about this, of, uh, of all the school districts in the country, only 388 schools were uh, nominated as such or designated as such, and only uh, we were one of 25 school districts in the state of Ohio. So congratulations to our entire music department across the board. And again, congratulations for being uh, so recognized as one of the best communities for music education. Terrific. Uh, also, I also had a distinct privilege today to go around to a couple of our buildings. Uh, we recognize our recipients of our Anderson Area Chamber of Commerce Teacher of the Year and also the Student of the Year today. Uh, we'll bring these two people to our next board meeting to recognize them publicly, but it uh, really gave me pleasure to honor John English, Senor English, uh, from our Turpin High School as our Teacher of the Year, and also as our Student of the Year from Anderson High School, Alex Stringfellow. Uh, you will recognize Alex's name. He's been in front of the board a couple times for his work on uh, lots of things that he has done. Uh, just one of the most well-rounded students uh, that I've been associated with or we've been associated with. We have such great kids uh, in our district that to, to find just one or to denominate and choose just one was very difficult. Um, a, a team of educators went through all those nominations and um, uh, basically with uh, Alex Stringfellow and again, Senior English as our Teacher of the Year. Thank you. Jeff, any correspondence? Uh, next thing on the agenda is uh, procedure for public commentary. Um, as we've stated before, uh, this is not a public meeting, but a, a meeting held in public. Uh, there's a time for public participation during the meeting as indicated on the agenda. Uh, individuals who'd like to share their opinions or comments concerning a topic on the board's ad agenda should list the uh, agenda item on the topic on a note card available uh, from one of the ladies here uh, in the front of the room, Mrs. Monk. 
including your name, address, telephone number. Uh, you'll be recognized uh, during public commentary. Remarks should be addressed to the board as a group and be within five minutes of time. If several people wish to speak on the same topic, uh, the time limit will be adjusted. Um, as always, if you have uh, questions or issues about faculty or staff, uh, that should be addressed uh, to the building principal or the superintendent. Uh, let's see. Next up is public commentary, and at this point, I don't have any green cards. Okay, I thought we were going to have at least one speaker this evening. Got a lot of green cards. Yep. My first time yep. Here, so. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll let you yeah, go, go ahead, ahead with that, here. and we'll move on to the next <laughs> item. Uh, at this point, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, our uh, state representative, Representative Tom Brinkman, who is with us this evening to give a legislative report. Mr. Brinkman, thank you very much for being here. There's lots going on. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tom Brinkman. I'm the 27th Ohio House District uh, member uh, from this area. Um, was sworn into the House on the 5th of January uh, for my, uh, I guess it'd be my fifth term since I served for eight years before from 2001 to 2008. Uh, we immediately uh, were given the governor's uh, budget, which included um, pretty drastic uh, numbers for Forest Hill School District, as for most of the school districts that I represent. Uh, I also represent uh, Marymount, Indian Hill, Loveland, uh, and Sycamore, uh, along with the city of Cincinnati. Uh, I can tell you that that uh, those are that his numbers are dead on arrival. Uh, we're not going to follow his scheme there. I can't tell you what it's going to be, but I believe it's going to be rosier than the uh, picture that he uh, drew. Uh, essentially, he felt that since uh, you can pass levies, uh, you get less money, so you can pass more levies. And I don't think that's right because we all pay taxes to the state of Ohio and it should be distributed fairly. Uh, it also rewards folks who maybe aren't. Um, putting more skin in the game. Uh, the second thing that really was uh, interesting was we uh, worked on the Common Core solution. Uh, my campaign was focused heavily on uh, getting rid of Common Core. I basically want teachers to be able to do their job, which is to teach to students, not to teach to a test. I don't like the Common Core standards. I don't like all the rigmarole and the data mining with Common Core. And we did introduce a bill uh, that uh, moved pretty quickly. It was actually the first bill that passed the General Assembly and the governor has signed. It was House Bill 7 and it started to, it uh, started the process by allowing parents to opt out of the Common Core tests. Uh, I know it gives you guys a little heartburn because you got to differentiate, uh, but it was something we felt we had to do. Uh, we know we have to address some other things uh, like uh, making sure that those who've opted out, their, their counts don't count in your overall grades. Uh, we are working uh, with another House bill, which is I think 74, uh, that will help do that. Uh, it's right now in the House and it still needs to get a, a few more uh, changes made, go over to the Senate, see what they want to do. But overall, uh, the vision that I have, and I think the vision at least of the House, is to uh, get rid of Common Core from the state of Ohio and join some of those other states that have done that and you know really start moving back to again the ability for teachers to teach and not be worried about all the testing and all the stuff that you have to go through for all that stuff. Um, uh, I have had the opportunity to meet with uh, the superintendent uh, Jackson and, and um, uh, the pres school board president uh, previously and talk about some other issues that were involved but uh, obviously Common Core is a big one from that I've heard from the, the voters. Uh, the final thing that I think is uh, very important uh, is that uh, I have heard from you folks and others the ability for high school students, seniors to get college credit and uh, there's always a m movement to shift that on to who's going to pay for it. And um, the feeling that it's all going to be thrown on you guys, I don't like that. Uh, that's not fair. Uh, I think if the governor wants it, we have to have uh, higher ed has to pick up some of the tab. I think some you guys could take. And I think some of the parents need to put some skin in the game too 
um, instead of just throwing it all on the school district and you guys having to, to pay for that. Uh, that is, again, going to be part of the budget discussions. It really hasn't come up yet because we're still about a month away and we're grappling with uh, Medicaid expansion uh, more than anything. Uh, but it's, uh, we will get to that and I'm certainly going to chime in and feel that we need to be fair in, in that regard. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of an update on the, the ideas with education that have been coming along. Um, certainly there's always little bills here and there that you, you hear pop up. Somebody today was circulating a bill to bring cursive back. Um, I don't know if I ever left, but um, to, to mandate that we have cursive. And I don't like mandates. Again, I don't like that, but the mandate, I think it was a fifth grade requirement cursive. Um, I know someone's been lobbying me awful hard to mandate uh, CPR training of all high school seniors. Um, it's not a bad idea, but again, the mandate aspect and what's that cost and what's it do. I know there was a bill passed where we mandated that you have um, asthma inhalers in everywhere, everywhere. And I mean, not only in schools, but in uh, camps, uh, I guess fit works and those types of places. And again, mandatory. So, um, uh, you know, those types of things kind of make me bristle and, and they cost, there's an expense. So uh, I do keep an eye out on those. I, I can't say I can stop every one. Uh, there's a lot of political um, uh, pressure to take. And I'll, I've said this many times uh, um, as I'll close here. Um, there was a young man who was uh, playing around, as they're allowed to do, in a school up in Mason, and some um, tables fell down on him. It's back of, about 10 years ago, and he died. And so the idea was we need to have uh, a safety inspector in every school building in the state of Ohio. And um, I was one of the few people to vote against that. And I had young children at the time, young boys, and I felt for that. But again, government continues to close the barn door after the horse escaped. And um, the bill passed and was signed into law. And then uh, Ted Strickland, as governor uh, a few years later, basically vacated it and took it out of the budget because he said it's, it's hard to afford all that. And so again, it's tough to stand up for some of these mandates and the, the resulting TV commercials and uh, pressure that, you know, uh, Brinkman doesn't like doesn't care about the kids who are being crushed by uh, tables, and I do, but it's, it's at what cost and what we have to put taxpayers, the school districts, you folks through. And so you can count on me to take those hard votes to stand up against those things um, because of the resulting uh, uh, mandates that are put upon you. I guess I trust you to do the best you can, make the place safe, and accidents do happen. So anyway, that's what I wanted to sum up with. I don't know if you have any questions, uh, if you want to uh, do that, uh, President uh, Smith, but uh, I'm more than happy to take them. Well, you actually hit the top three issues that I had, okay. which were budget, <laughs> uh, zeros for common core tests, and uh, the uh, funding of the dual credit. Uh, I also appreciate you bringing up, e even though it's a uh, sensitive subject, but uh, all the very special interests that want us to do everything for them. Uh, I know I testified in Columbus on a bill a couple years ago, and I think I put together a list of, it was over two dozen different special interest opportunities that there were, and if we did what everybody wanted schools to do, we would have no time to do teaching. Uh, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not, not too much. So I appreciate, even, even though it's difficult to uh, you know, address them individually, uh, it's a sensitive issue, but I appreciate the fact that you uh, trust us to do what's right. Does anybody on the board have any questions for Representative Brinkman or Treasurer or Superintendent? I just wondered a little bit about the, uh, the college credit. You know, two months ago, three months ago, there was nothing. And we, have, we have a dual enrollment, working well, doing local control, we're, we're working things, then all of a sudden a gigantic mandate comes from the state. And I wonder just some of what the background is. I mean, none of us, we had never, it wasn't even on our radar. And then all of a sudden this huge thing, we have a couple of uh, people that their jobs became 
figure this out because that's be done by March. I mean, it went from zero to 60 like that. Huge mandate. We don't know where the money's coming from. We don't know. And it, it actually disrupted, as I understand, our program, which was very well done, well liked. We're doing it great. We're, you know, our, our local people are happy. Local control, lower government, and then all of a sudden this mandate from above comes up. And I, I just you know, was it the, the institutes of higher learning that pushed this? I mean, certainly the school districts that I know of didn't push it. I, I just don't know how it came about. Well, I, I can't specifically answer that other than the fact that I know that um, uh, Governor uh, Kasich has uh, given the, the higher ed has uh, basically been in a favored position under his administration. And uh, during his budget, he, he pushed on them the control costs a little bit more. Uh, and I guess that's one of the things they settled on. Uh, it certainly didn't come through the legislature or what we wanted to do. Um, but we have heard what you just talked about uh, uh, coming at us. So that's why I think we're going to push back when it comes to the higher ed budget. Um, and, and, you know, we're, 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 we're dealing with a, um, a governor who's got some higher ambitions and a lot of stuff he kind of pushes off and puts on overdrive and then it falls down on us. And I don't know whether he's tone deaf or in New Hampshire or something like that. Well, I think he is in New Hampshire right now. But uh, uh, we have heard from you and we are pushing back. But you're right, it just kind of came out of nowhere. That, you know, all of a sudden, uh, again, if, I think they're looking, hey, we've got to cut 5%. Let's see what we can get back on the other side, you know? And that's, that's how they work. Anyone else? Appreciate you taking the time to okay. uh, well, share with us. Thank you very much and hope to make a few more of these uh, uh, as the budget progresses. Um, hopefully we'll be voting the budget out in about a month. In about a month. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And now if there's no objection from the board, we'll go back in the agenda to public comments. Uh, hearing no objection, uh, I want to introduce uh, Matt Wagner, who has a issue to promote scouting, specifically Cub Scouts. Here? Right there, yep. <sighs> Well, thank you. Thank you all as well. Um, I am the uh, Cub Master for Wilson Pack 867, and it's been my honor to be involved with uh, Cub Scouts. I'm, I'm wearing Turpin, but if I had Forest Hills just in general, I would have worn it. Uh, I've coached a lot of uh, Anderson boys as well. Um, I've got a, a, a freshman over at Turpin, and I've got a fourth grader at Wilson. and. Uh, I've actually been involved in the leadership role uh, for Cub Scouts since 2006 when uh, my, my freshman was a first grader. So I've had the opportunity to be involved for a long time and uh, I've really uh, had the opportunity to uh, create just some lifelong friendships uh, with a lot of the, uh, the dads and even moms uh, as it relates to uh, being involved with the Cub Scouts. This is my last year. Uh, I've got a, a Weeblo 2 now, and he'll graduate to go in fifth grade when he's in fifth grade up to Cub Scouts, or Boy Scouts, excuse me. And so one of the mottos uh, with Cub Scouts, you know, besides do your best, which is for the kids, is, is always leaving something better than when you came. And so, you know, for me, having been involved now with the Cub Scouts uh, for this period of time, there's been some change, if you will, in terms of how you can uh, do recruitment within Forest Hill School District and and again I, I've, I just do what they tell me you know in terms of how you do that or what you're supposed to do and so you know I'll go to the meetings and I'll you know listen and get coached by the folks at the Danbeard Council and there are we're in the Blue Jacket District and they'll tell us you know all the neat innovative things that you can do to uh, foster recruitment you know such as roller skating uh, doing something at the carnivals doing the different activities outside of the school. Now, what I'm not telling you is that when I first started uh, at Wilson, we had roughly 112 uh, boys in Cub Scouts. This was back in 06. Today, we have 63. So we're roughly half the size. Uh, we are actually considered one of the largest uh, in terms of uh, enrollment or Cub Scouts per student, if you will, for uh, 
our district for being Wilson. For instance, Summit Elementary right now doesn't even have a Cub Scout program and it comes and goes each year talking with the leadership over there. The reason why I'm here today is, is I really do not want to get involved with interrupting school as you so uh, alluded to as it relates to all of the uh, extracurricular or other activities that the pressures that come on to the school and, and, and all of our teachers. That is, that is farther from where I want to go. Um, what I want to do is I want to bring back what's called scout talks in which we're not doing it during a time that learning is occurring. It would be during a time such as uh, lunch or recess. So therefore we can do a quick discussion. Two minutes, two to four minutes is all I'm asking for to actually be in front of these boys. And actually it wouldn't even be me. It'd be a professionally trained individual from the Dan Beard Council that would be doing it. I'd like to do it, but I understand, you know, there's some, some balance there that we have to account for. Um, so that, that's why I wanted to come here. I want to I leave the Cub Scouts in a better place than when I came. I, I really, I know that, I know that Forest Hill School District is awesome. I mean, I, I live it, I love it. What you just acknowledged today about, you know, I got a French horn player. I mean, it, it's, it's awesome. awesome. I mean, you, you teachers and principals are phenomenal. Um, you know, early childhood development. I mean, Forest Hills, um, I think, is probably a role model for the state in terms of just what you pour into our kids. And, uh, and I'm, I'm definitely a beneficiary of that. My kids are awesome, and, it, and a lot has to do with, with, the, with the teachers and the, and the, and the great group here. Um, what I want to say, though, and again, just so that you can understand what I'm talking about, okay, when I talk about Cub Scouts, we're talking about core values citizenship, compassion, cooperation, courage, faith, health and fitness, honesty, perseverance, positive attitude, resourcefulness, respect and responsibility. Those are all key values that we want all of our sons to have. And the other thing is that if it was to be at a time when there would also be uh, girls that would be there, we would of course make mention of the Girl Scout program and probably give them a name or number to contact as it relates to that. So we would offset both of those things. So again, I know I'm interrupting a very busy schedule. I'm really humbled that you've given me the opportunity. We thank you for your comments. And thank you. And your service too. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on to the agenda, uh, district update from the superintendent, Dr. Jackson. Uh, yes, I would, I'd like to introduce Joe Kunkel from our design team, SSOE, and he would like to share some of the work at Aaron Sherwood. Uh, these are the two buildings that we will be looking at uh, getting off the ground uh, in the fairly near future, and that's what Joe wants to talk to us a little bit about tonight. So, Joe. Okay. Uh, members of the board administration, pleased to be here. And I think this will be a uh, beginning of many meetings such as this. This is uh, part of the process. Uh, and bringing forth the concept design first, uh, and from this point moving on to the um, full-fledged design and construction document phase of the project. And the two today are Aaron Sherwood to present the, the concept. Um, I think what's important is where we're at was developed through a process that dealt with a lot of, uh, a lot of input, so a lot of appreciation for everybody involved in all the sessions we had. Uh, we began with uh, Visioning sessions right after the, uh, the beginning uh, with the uh, facilities group from each of the schools. Uh, we followed up with another visioning session with them. And then we went into uh, meetings with the resource groups. Uh, out of those initial visioning sessions, then also several meetings with the administrators, uh, the, the plan took shape. This is uh, the plan for air. Um, actually, they're very similar. And the, uh, you probably, most of you have seen fairly familiar, so I won't spend a whole lot of time going through too much detail. but. Creating, uh, again, the classroom areas, taking the, we call the classroom pod for each grade level, uh, putting demising walls between the, the groups of four classrooms and creating, in essence, a corridor serving uh, security in terms of lockdown. Uh, the walls, in addition to security, acoustical uh, provisions of those walls. Uh, and also, from technology standpoint, putting walls in now allows us to put power in those rooms they did not have before. Uh, so that's key to that. The, the entry area, I don't necessarily well pointing here, but toward the entry up uh, in this area. There will be the security vestibule. The administration area will be up in that area also. Uh, relocating the music room. Uh, and then art gets relocated. And actually, there are two ends of the buildings. A lot of that has to do with the circulation. That kind of came from the 
the users of the school and the requests in terms of how students are dispersed. Uh, the blue areas are what we call the, the specials. Those are the resource spaces for uh, occupational therapy, uh, uh, the OT, the PT, uh, the uh, ELL, uh, also uh, uh, reading, reading intervention. Um, and those are, def are still in the process of being defined 100%, but that's the allocation of those areas in the air plan. In the end, you're seeing the, uh, the green at the end are the uh, kindergarten uh, classroom scenarios. The upper ones are the ones that actually is the new addition that's going on in the building. Uh, we've met again with the, uh, the primary, uh, the different grade levels, the intermediate grade levels. Uh, we've met uh, a couple times with some of them. Uh, kindergarten, we've met with uh, some of the, uh, again, the resource groups associated with art, music, uh, media center. Uh, so again, a lot of meetings, not just for buy-in, but to get information so that we could design it the way that it works best for the educational delivery in the building where they want to be uh, as we proceed forward. <coughs> this is the, the classroom pod area showing those walls. We're still kind of working out the final dimension of those walls and <coughs> some of the uh, aspects of those rooms, but in general that's what we're creating in those areas. Uh, you see the similar thing on, on, Sh on Sherwood also. Uh, plan layout. The most significant thing here is we met with everybody that if they stood in the middle of the room or toward the end of the classroom area, still be able to see the other three classrooms within the pod range of, of four classrooms. And then the walls themselves, as we say, we're still kind of working on the final dimension, but that's where there'll be additional power uh, and provisions to support technology, teaching walls, teaching services. We went through that discussion, still defining uh, what becomes primary teaching walls, secondary. Working through a high level of detail that comes up next as we proceed forward, that we get into room by room, completely defining each of the spaces. Uh, the, the exterior, there's, go ahead and hit this. There's three slides here. You'll kind of see a variation of the three. And we went, this is one with community meeting became involved. Uh, when talking to the community, what they really see and experience is from the outside and the feeling. And we said the, we can have individual identities to these two schools. You don't have to look like the same from the outside. So there's going to be a little difference at the air. They basically, uh, like the, the uh, between the, actually the next two, they like the glass up high, a little different canopy, so we kind of looked at that, and I think the last one, go one more. And again, we're not there yet, but they let less canopy, a little more glass up high. Uh, you'll see that when we get to Sherwood, it's a little more canopy, and not so much glass up, up on, on the higher areas. So again, we're still working with them in terms of that identity of the schools, but uh, th this is the direction we're headed. And then the side view, uh, again, going back, the glass is to the front. Uh, so you just get, get a feel for what the look will be. You'll see the glass, uh, oops, the glass to the side there. We're opening up more window into the cafeteria, which was very important because when we, really getting light in the school in general is important. So getting light into the cafeteria, uh, the entry will be pulled out so there'll be glass on the other side also. Um, and we're even talking about putting a, a skylight in the media center so that that area gets daylit also. So really throughout the building, there is a sense of daylight. You can see daylight throughout the, throughout the facility. Um, I'll go through Sherwood. And then uh, I said, there's questions as we go, or you can wait to the end. You see both of them and might work too. So well, we're not bashful. If we have questions, we'll You'll, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Similar plan layout. Uh, you can see the, the, the green area down to the left in terms of uh, pre-K, early childhood. Uh, there's a little different demographics in school, and that's accommodated as we get into the specials, uh, the uh, intervention, the OTPT, uh, and some of the other specials. Very little bit in terms of both schools, what, what was needed and what's required. So again, there's no need to make them exactly the same. Uh, we're still working out some circulation things with the school. The purple area is what we call extended learning areas. That's kind of an open area where students can work in groups, and then we set those up in, with uh, learning resource centers. Uh, that'll be defined by pretty much the furniture aspects of it. Uh, again, the music room down to the lower right. The art room is flipped in here from, uh, from air. Uh, and then administration, again, at the new entry uh, with the vestibule entry. The old uh, administration area there, which is also still the administration because it becomes the workroom, the teacher workroom space. Uh, again, kind of the 3D look at the plan there. Uh, the classroom scenario, again, these two may end up a little bit different. We don't know yet in terms of what the walls are. Uh, a little different philosophy potentially in terms of the teaching scenario in the uh, four classroom pods. 
uh, but that's kind of our next step uh, in terms of working through those spaces. Mm -hmm. But everything has been defined in terms of the, the, the basic layouts. Uh, again, the same, same plan again. Um, looking at that, the furniture just gives an idea. The furniture is going to be, intent, is be very flexible. So we're just showing a, uh, a furniture configuration layout. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for however they might want to team teach. And we <coughs> it's a little different at the primary versus the intermediate level. Uh, so we're trying to be accommodating that scenario also. Uh, the, the, the same thing, we gave three images here. And then the third one, uh, kind of change the colors around again, just to show that we're looking for a different identity. And at the end, the last slide then, or the next slide, um, there's a couple slides here. They kind of want more canopy, so we kind of pull um, more canopy. We may add some more glass up high. We're still working that piece out. But again, the idea is a little bit of a different identity in terms of the entrance to the buildings and how that might look. And at the very end, um, this pulling away further and kind of get a sense of it. This is basically showing the next step. We're already working on this is basic construction documents. We're working on laying out the hard walls, figuring out the hard walls, uh, actually looking at the additions, working out the details. Uh, and that's where we now pr proceed um, to create the construction documents that become the documents for bid, which will come back to you in May or June for approval on those. Ray, for any other questions? I, uh, just a, uh, one, Joe. Um, both schools <clears throat> seem to be packed to the gills. And in the community meetings, there were a number of people expressing not only um, concerns about uh, storage for teacher items, but also storage for kid items. Are you, what, what are you thinking about for, for storage areas for the, especially for the classroom areas? Yeah. Actually, in the, uh, we're creating some areas called resource areas, um, and particularly uh, with AIR, which is the, high, the highest population, um, they, they'll show up right next to the kindergarten area, they're the, they're the blue area. Um, but it's, it's made to actually be by grade level, so space is assigned to them. Uh, and we've also accommodated an additional storage area that really hasn't been defined 100% in the old art room. So we've created quite a bit more storage within the facility. The, the, Thing we're proposing though is now to work it so some of that stuff you know can be out of the classrooms and in these other storage areas uh, so, so we are defining those as actual storage locations as we're going through we're going to work with you know each of the schools in terms of the we're going to go and quantify you know how much they have of each thing how much storage is in the classroom uh, and how much can go somewhere else they still need quite a bit in the classroom we're, we're working out a number of wardrobe units and uh, uh, all the different scenarios in terms of um, book storage versus cabinet storage. Uh, that gets into this kind of next level we're headed to. Great. So. Thank you, Joe. And, and how about uh, additional space? I know at Sherwood we actually had a little bit of capacity, but it, here we were pushing our capacity. And I know the um, pre-K that we were looking at are all day kindergarten. Are we putting some additional classes over there? Yes. At area, I mean, we have the extra you know, kindergarten, for or kindergarten all day, and we've you know obtained space. I mean, we're giving them more space to teach. We have not been able to increase the number of classrooms still four per grade level at, at air. But but to be clear, you're adding building square, square footage, correct? In addition right. to what's there now, correct. so we are increasing the you're size correct. of the building. That is correct. Yeah, we're increasing out the front end of the size, so we're increasing um, roughly 2,400, about 3,500 to 4,000 square feet. So it's a decent sized addition we're adding to it. At air. Yes, actually both schools is just what goes into those additions. It's a little different. Any other questions? I just want to comment. I know when we went through the, the bond campaign, there were a lot of concerns over who was going to get to make the decisions or how is this going to come down and uh, who was going to decide what and how was input going to be gathered. And I just want to say what we're seeing is a culmination of a, many meetings uh, meetings with administration, faculty, open meetings, and I uh, attended many of these and saw that you uh, listened and came back with solutions to some of the issues that were raised. And so I feel comfortable, and I, I know the rest of the board has you know, concerns to make sure that we're following through on the process that we said we would. And like I said, what I've seen so far is we're, the district is very much doing that, and you are uh, facilitating 
that. And so I applaud you know, the, what you're doing and the innovative solutions you're coming back with. Also, uh, notice one size doesn't fit all. Uh, what you're doing at one building isn't necessarily exactly what's happening at the other. Uh, you've right. been taking into consideration some of the input from the community meetings to be able to do things. I think they're going to wind up slightly different, but that's mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So I just, I, you know, I think that's a good thing that uh, the way you're approaching it. Uh, and, and we're still working within the budgets at each building, right? Yes. Yes. Interesting comment I heard from some of the people that attended the meetings. They said, "Gee." We're getting more than I thought we would get. Now we haven't built anything yet, but I mean, but still, <laughs> just just the idea of, of what's being proposed is uh, better than what I think the original uh, thoughts were that we were going to get out of the budget. So now uh, the challenge will be to you yeah. to make yeah. sure we deliver on that. Correct. But uh, but I appreciate it. That is part of the next phase. As we've developed this concept, then we have you know continue to work to the budget. Uh, the main thing up front, we had those additions, the basically administrative area additions, roughly 1,500 square feet as defined. The other piece comes from the kind of additional classroom budget. So when we had those classrooms off to the same corner in each building, uh, comes from that pocket of money. So. Any other questions? Any comments, Dr. Jackson? Uh, other than, uh, if you take a look, I mean, that was just kind of the schematic design, but we're also looking at uh, uh, New and improved lighting throughout, uh, new air conditioning controls, the wheel be air conditioning, the gymnasium. Uh, in fact, we'll be working on that this summer uh, at AIR. And then our goal is, is that once the, the, the design and the, uh, uh, the bid packages get put out, uh, which is probably later, late spring, early summer, that uh, beginning as early as this winter, uh, late, late fall to winter, we can get our groups in here and be working on the outside of our facilities, these two buildings. Uh, additional community meetings are still taking place. I think they're published on our website. Uh, I would encourage anybody who has an interest to attend. I noticed some of the meetings I've attended already. There were people who had future kids. Uh, maybe their kids had already been there. Uh, so it's a, it's a community uh, activity and everybody's encouraged to come and participate because uh, it is our community anyway. Uh, unless anybody else has anything else, I'll say thank you very much. Well, th thank you. I look forward to coming back for the uh, final presentation. Uh, moving on to the second part of the superintendent's update. I think, Christine, you're going to be presenting this. Before you actually start, I just want to point out, um, you know, we did have an issue back in August or September within our district, uh, a security issue, and um, we didn't sweep it under the rug. It was unfortunate. It occurred. And uh, I think today, part of what you're going to be reporting on is some of the follow-up to, uh, to the action steps that the district is taking as a result of, of a, uh, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even, it wasn't hacking, it was a simple human error yeah. that occurred. But nevertheless, uh, I, I simply want to point out that the district, you know, we didn't sweep it under the rug and uh, took action, and uh, this is part of a uh, follow-up to, to what took place. Sure. I apologize because for some reason it seems to be off the screen. So we're going to have a security update. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to see if you're paying attention. No, um, as Randy was saying, situations come up. Forest Hills is just like every other company. If you go ahead and hit the next slide, 50% of companies will experience or have experienced a security breach. That's one half. That's every business. If you go down the town center, take half of those. They are, they've been exposed to a security breach of some type. And some may or may not even know it. So schools are no different than any other organization. However, there are some things that actually give us some additional layers of protections. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about kind of how our structure is. I'm going to be somewhat general. I don't want to jeopardize ourselves, you know, anymore by giving too much away. Go ahead and hit the next slide. So essentially a normal security structure is you have the internet and then you have a firewall. And companies have a firewall plus they may have what's called an appliance or some way that they take the traffic and say yes you can go through, no you can't. Um, it's another type of firewall that protects you. And then it goes to the client or the computer. Forest Hills has a two-part security structure because we go through HCCA, which they're considered our ITC. So they house all of our district data and all of our true 
information system is housed there. It is encrypted, it is backup, it has disaster recovery, and it is, it's the powerhouse of security. So they offer a firewall for Forest Hills in addition to access control lists and all kinds of other things that you may or may not understand. Could, could you just mention yes. what HCCA is? Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, sure. It's our ITC and they have, <laughs> how's that for helping? Yeah. Um, so they're, they're essentially our, our data collection site. So they provide our services. If your parents out there, Progress Book, they provide that service for us. It's called um, Hamilton County Computer Hamilton County Computer Association. Yeah, Hamilton County Cooperative Association. Can we help? Can we work on this collectively? <laughs> Hamilton County Yeah. That. <laughs> See? We just make it simple and we go to simplify and we'll um, say HCCA is the ITC. I'm kidding. No. So essentially, they are the ones that provide all of our largest resources. They are our student information system which we use to schedule students and do all the things that we do. Progress book to do our grades and that type of stuff. It's all housed there. And they're essentially our Fort Knox of data. So you go through and then data passes through them and then it's sent to us if it passes the test to get past there. So we have additional tests on our end. So we have additional protections. Go to the next slide, please. I'm hoping you can see it. Oh, so. This is how HCCA mitigates the risk. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we mitigate the risk. They provide our web filter, which helps protect our children, helps protect our staff, and everyone else. So that's an easy layer of security to say, yes, the traffic is OK, or no, it is not. They encrypt the data, which means if you would look at it, it looks like garbage. You would not be able to read it. If a layperson opened up a file, it's going to look like gobbledygook. You're not going to understand it. They offer encryption. They monitor our network. They have graphs and all kinds of things and reporting um, and things that they look at. They have what's called black hole routing, which is over on the far left. So essentially, they assess the traffic as it comes in. If it's not good, it goes in the black hole. It doesn't even get to us. And in addition is the firewall, which we already discussed. Go ahead, the next slide. So then it goes to us. And then this is how we mitigate our risk. We have antivirus. We have a system that as soon as the system comes on, antivirus, it notices that there's no antivirus on the system, it's pushed out. We have offer two-step verification for our Google clients. We only offer that for staff. For students, it requires a mobile phone. But for staff, we're making that recommendation. We also have up in the left, it's called network optimization. And what that essentially means is something like Napster or uh, BitTorrent, which are peer-to-peer -peer sharing. We've given it zero as far as its priority. It cannot go anywhere. No student can get do any peer-to-peer -peer sharing. It's called packet shaping. And essentially, it takes the traffic, it looks at the traffic before it sends it anywhere, and it says, hey, are you allowed to do this? It fits in this category. No, you cannot. So it gets zero bandwidth. So it helps protect our network in that way. In addition, we have monitoring. We can tell who does what when it comes to traffic. So we know where people are going as far as the sites, especially we keep track of the peer-to-peer. -peer. We keep track of the VPN type traffic. Peer-to-peer -peer doesn't get anything, but VPNs we keep track of. It's another hole for us if we don't keep track of it. We can do that through this technology. We also use what is called MAC address filtering. So what that means is all of the computers have a fingerprint on them essentially. So this fingerprint, go, we look at the fingerprint and we say, yeah, we like you. We, have, we say you're okay. You can get an IP address from us or you can connect to the internet. So we have that currently and that's how students are getting on to our guest network. If we don't have their MAC address or their fingerprint, as I'm calling it, they don't get on. And at the high school and at Nagel, we're using that technology. At the elementary, it isn't necessary because we, they have our devices. They're already protected and on our network. But when you have BYOD, you open yourself up to additional risk. So that's how we try to mitigate our risk and to protect them as well as protect our network. And so the, the students are in this network. We've had this fingerprint analysis has been done. They're safe, but they're over here. Our staff and anybody that's on our network is over here. They're segmented and they're apart. And they're also in things called subnet. And I'm sorry, is, is, are we in my? Getting or am I too up here? All right, very good. 
Depends so depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> so I should have directed that question over here. Right, right. Like the bag and Am I trying to? I'm trying to give it in layman's terms, but um, so we have what are called subnets, and what that means is Anderson has its own cluster of things. So anybody that does activity in Anderson is only at Anderson. Turpin cannot see anything that Anderson is doing. So even if a student has gone awry and they're rogue and they're doing things, <coughs> Turpin is not impacted. No other district or no other building is impacted, only Anderson. So we have that in every building. Now, some things can happen, and they have happened, where there's been a um, denial of service attack. And what that means is essentially you're getting blasted by traffic. And it's blasting, and it actually blasts at HCCA. If there's a denial of service, HCCA catches all of that heat. And as I was telling you, there are first layer of protection, that black hole routing, all of a sudden it goes here. We're not getting any traffic at that point. They, they've absorbed all of the shock, but it's taken, we get no bandwidth because the denial of service attack takes it down. So that's part of <coughs> how we protect that part. We're also moving to what is called a, um, a radius server. And what that means is then I'll know, so if Natasha Adams logs on, I say, hey, I know Natasha Adams. She logged on, it was successful. I'm gonna give her an IP address. So Chelsea McCormick logs on. Oh, she's a student. I know this because I know her email address. She's going to get an IP address. So we're going to start then looking at their username. So it's going to help us protect them a little bit more. They will auto One of the things that we've struggled with in our network is that when students, if somehow they find out the secure network password, then they're over here and they're swimming in this body of water. We need for them to be over here always. So by the radius server, Anytime a student logs in, they automatically stay over here. So that, that's our next layer of what we're putting in, and it's actually already up. We just haven't deployed it yet. So that's how we mitigate our risk as far as protection. Go ahead. And I apologize that the slides are a little funky. The next layer is mitigating risk by housing less data. So as far as student social security numbers, there was a day when we housed them. We do not. Uh, we let HCCA do all of that work. We don't need them for the work that we do. We don't keep them. So it's just less information to have. If a security breach were to happen, we don't have to worry about that. Less threat of identity um, threat issues. So lastly is education. And this is probably the most challenging uh, because we, user behavior is the, most, the biggest challenge that we have clicking on things that we shouldn't be clicking on, installing things that we really don't know what we're installing, but it looks great on the internet. Because what that comes with is they have all this malware and stuff just piggybacked on the back of it. They're installing the software, but they're also installing, installing the malware with it. So part of our, our, probably the biggest challenge, technology can mitigate some risk, but we can't alter user behavior. We can only protect so much. So this is something that we're gonna spend a lot of time on. We have a cybersecurity team that we're forming so that we can look at how do we protect our parents? You know, how can they learn more about what their students are doing? How do we protect our students? And how do we protect our staff? And how do we help everybody to be just a little bit smarter anytime they log onto the computer knowing what the students are doing and what those risks of gaming and some of the other things, if you're not paying attention, um, you know, gaming is not all bad, but you just have to be aware because when you have an Xbox Live or one of those services, you're all of a sudden talking to somebody across the globe that may or may be a hacker and they may not, you just don't know. So you gotta be very, very cautious. And that's, that's the security. Do you, are, you, are you awake? Uh, if I might add, <laughs> could you just take one minute, Christine, sure. and talk about our external audits that we've done on our databases and a lot of the different programs we're using sure. from sure. external organizations? We have a database company that helps us to look at our database structure <clears throat> and to look and make sure that our security is up to what it needs to be, what we're housing, that everything, you know, there. anytime you have any kind of program, it opens up little ports. So we make sure that all those ports are tight that everything is protected the way it needs to be protected. We only have the logins that we need to have. Those are all the things that we do. In addition to just looking at all of our software systems, we're trying to whittle down. You know, we, we may have started out like this, thinking everybody needs access. We're starting to kind of pare that down to who absolutely needs it and it's critical to their job function. Any other questions? 
I have one. Um, sure. I'm sorry that I don't know this, but how much do we pay HCCA? Do we pay them on a yearly basis to do this for us? We pay them for services differently. Okay. So for the internet, it's about $50,000, and that includes the filtering on top of that. We pay them for progress, but we pay them for financial okay. and different services. And a lot of other schools around us use them as well? Or? Yes, yes. So they're absolutely. the... They're, they're very good, and they, they also listen very well, and we've, we've had conversations anytime security. As soon as they see something in the network monitoring, I'm getting an email. This is the IP address. We look it up, and because we have that fingerprint stuff I was telling you about, I can know exactly who it is. Thank you. My pleasure. So you, you yes. probably said this, and mm -hmm. there are somewhere along the HCCA, <coughs> yeah, ITC, right. VPN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. we, we've got, I don't know what any of it means. <laughs> we've got kids that have Chromebooks, mm -hmm. ours. Correct. We've got others that are bringing their devices. They bring in their devices, or they take the Chromebooks home with them. Mm -hmm while they're not on our system, Correct. get on some site, pick up some of that malware or another virus, and bring it back and log into our system? That's the beauty of Chromebooks. Is, they're not getting malware. It, it is a browser-based system completely. It is, it is in, it, you don't have the risk. Mm -mm. All right, so what about the bring your own device? That's theirs, and that's what I was telling you as far as that segment, that they're in this pool over here swimming around. They're, they're swimming with like people. We're protecting ourselves <coughs> over here. So, and we, we make the recommendation for antivirus. We usually know pretty quickly when there's a problem because they're into our tech squads and our tech squads are removing the malware or the virus or whatever is infecting their system because it, stops, it starts functioning poorly or they get pop-ups. So we, we usually detect it pretty quickly. And in addition, when I was telling you about the monitoring, and the, tra the traffic stuff, we watch that, so we can also see it. As soon as we start seeing a lot of traffic from one IP address, we look and see who it is. Any other questions? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your explanation. Sure. Um, I know some of what was done was done in response to some community member sure. requests from mm -hmm. what happened in August. I also want to point out, though, that what happened to us was nothing like um, anything that would lead to identity theft or financial issues, Correct. like some things we read about in the paper where people are taking credit card numbers. That, that It was some email addresses that Correct. were exposed. And so we, we didn't have anything that was as serious as some of the things we're reading about. But I still appreciate the fact that you've moved ahead with appropriate measures to protect, protect our data. Absolutely. And in addition, one of the things I'd like to say, we've, we've migrated our district to Google Apps, and all that data is encrypted. So it's encrypted both sides, and it's a much better protection than just saving it on your C drive or your documents. So we, we just keep adding up the layer of protection, but we're going to have to attend to it, and it's going to have it's going to be a rising. Um, it's going to have to have more and more attention. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Moving you. on the agenda, item uh, 7.3, authorization for law firm, Dr. Jackson. Yes, uh, uh, at our organizational meeting, um, we. Um, uh, look at and, and approve the law firms that represent us. Uh, this particular one is a name change. Uh, Ennis Robertson Fisher is changing their name to Ennis Britton. They have expanded uh, throughout the state of Ohio, so that's a, a name change. And then the second is actually the addition of Gradenhead and Ritchie, LLP. Uh, Gradenhead and Ritchie will be doing some work when it comes to our um, uh, benefits packages, some of our HIPAA, HIPAA policies and those types of things. Um, so we are asking the board, uh, I'm asking the board to recommend that uh, they approve the, uh, uh, our working with Graydon Head and Ritchie as well as uh, the name change for Ennis Robertson Fisher to Ennis Britton Company, LPA. I move that we uh, approve Ennis Britton Company and Graydon Head and Ritchie as uh, legal counsel. Second. Any discussion? And everybody can vote on this, correct? No issues? Okay. Uh, Treasurer, please call the roll. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Uh, moving on to board discussion. I don't think we have an official topic for this evening, but I'm going to take the privilege. I just came back from three days of uh, uh, the National School Board Association Conference. In, in just a couple minutes, touch on some observations and some trends that, that I heard about. Uh, one of the key ones was just the impact of litigation at the federal level and uh, Dear Cog letters uh, from the Department of Justice, and I guess maybe, does that just come from the Department of Justice, or does it also come from the Department of Education? 
Uh, but the speaker pointed out that they're neither dear nor colleagues, uh, but some of these things will impact us. It's just amazing to see the, the impact from, from some of these federal regulatory authorities, uh, how that will impact us, uh, the trickle down will, will impact us in a significant, I would say potentially negative way, uh, budget wise in the long run. Um, another observation was uh, how important strategic plans are. And at some point in the not too distant future, I'll be talking with our superintendent about possibly setting up a meeting for us to review and refresh our strategic plan. Uh, I know if, if you notice our agenda is, it does follow, every item leads back to our strategic plan in one way or another. And uh, I think that's something that we need to uh, dust off and make sure that, uh, that it's current and, uh, and that we're, we're following that. Another uh, trend that I saw was the interest in um, a longer school year. It wasn't necessarily always a longer school year, but it was more teaching or actually more learning time. And that had, there are a number of reasons for that. Sometimes it was to make up for time that's uh, taken up in testing. Uh, sometimes it's to cover, uh, they had a fancy term for this, but where students learn, lose knowledge over the summer. And it's a way to, uh, to, to keep them, keep that active. And uh, just more subjects that, that students are trying to cover during the year. So I know we've had some discussions about that, but I, I think that's another one that's gonna be, that will impact our district in a not too distant future. Um, another thing that uh, was presented as the future uh, was blended learning tied to one-to-one. -to -one. And uh, this is something that, uh, as you may recall, we just had a presentation, was it last month or the month before? And once again, I feel like Forest Hills is on the cutting edge of some of these things that they're saying are the future. And uh, I really appreciate the presentation uh, from uh, Natasha Adams and Lauren. Um, Angeloni. Angeloni, thank you very much. Uh, it, was, it very much showed that we were really out in front on, on those type of uh, educational topics. Uh, another thing that was uh, uh, being shared as something for the future was 21st century learning spaces. Learned a lot more about that here since we just had our bond issue, but uh, I think it's fortunate that we're going through the process right now because I, I, they are presenting how important that's gonna be for future uh, education models. And so I think it's, uh, it's, it's lucky that we have the bond issue passed that we're able to put some of that in place at this point. Um, another observation I had was really when I heard some of the key sessions about some of the problems that school districts are having and that we don't have in Forest Hills. We are absolutely blessed to have a school district where uh, we're able to focus on education issues instead of some of the issues that some of the rural or urban or even other suburban school districts uh, unfortunately are bogged down with. Uh, the amount of parent support that we get and what our parent organizations to deliver to this district. Uh, other school districts, when I talk to some of the people from around the country, they can't even imagine what we take for granted here in the Forest Hill School District. So I, 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 I guess we're bragging on ourselves here, but I also want to thank uh, everybody who contributes to that. Our faculty that, that delivers, uh, like I said, when I hear about what goes on in other school districts in the United States, uh, I just come back home and, you know, thank our lucky stars, we live in Forest Hills. But anyway, uh, that was, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on some of these topics uh, uh, at a future date, but I uh, just thought I'd share a few things since I just came back today and was all wound up over some really neat things. Um, okay, moving on, we do have a consent agenda for items 8.1 through 12.3. Uh, uh, item 9, student services. Excuse me, that would be 9.1 to 13.3. Okay. That's changed today, just so you know. All righty. Okay. Uh, items 9.1 and 9.2 are overnight trips. Uh, the first is our teachers' academies from Anderson and Turpin traveling to Washington, D.C., April 22nd through the 26th. The second is a motion to approve Anderson High School's DECA overnight trip to Orlando, Florida, April 24th through the 29th. There is an error in the student cost to this trip, and I've since corrected that uh, for the minutes. Um, the cost to students is $750, not 315 
and I have um, also uh, checked that there are fundraising opportunities for that particular trip. What kind? Seven hundred and fifty is a lot of money. Is that how are the kids doing? Are they all able to raise the money they need for the trips? From from what I understand, now they. Their fundraising is, is continuing. I don't know, Mr. Broadwater, if you have anything to add to that. But um, transportation will be covered by Great Oaks. It's air travel. Um, they have offset, from what I understand, um, from what we have understood, at least half of those costs, which I think was where the error was when we initially put 315. You have anything to add? Importantly, no student, uh, if you thought there was a student who was not going to be able to attend because of funding, you would be able to step in? That is in. correct. Okay. Yes, and we assure that when they Those are submit the, their... They're the heavier fundraising groups in the school, so I, I, I do see that on our end, so they do raise quite a bit of funds. That's That's so yes, yes, certainly <laughs> does. <laughs> well, especially with these trips, because Great Oaks is um, supporting both of these trips, and they fund a great deal of these costs. But, but at the end of the day, we know that if no student is not going Would be prevented from, it, thank you. from participating. Yeah. 9.3 is our InfoSnap services agreement and supplement. Um, this is um, a uh, student registration uh, system that is going to be provided for our newly enrolled students as well as our returning students. No longer will we be able Will we have to print paper packets uh, for our parents and previously submitted information um, will be able to be updated. We're very excited about this agreement and the supplement which is in the attachment. Um, the only addition that I need to make is that this is a service agreement and supplement for two school years, 15-16 and 16-17, which has also been corrected here. Um, our legal counsel has reviewed both agreements. And again, we are um, very excited about this tool. Um, we have developed an implementation team, which will begin uh, later this week to begin the process of implementation for our new students. We will start simple and uh, move into more um, in-depth types of form submissions and other types of services as we move into it. That's the section 14 of the agreement provides that it automatically reviews absent uh, our prior written notice. And if it automatically renews, it says it renews without any of the discounts, which in this contract are significant, plus a 5% increase. So that's fine as long as we diary prior to the end of the agreement to make sure that we terminate or give them notice not to renew and then have the opportunity to renegotiate those discounts. Okay, I, I will make note of that as well. Mr. Eckert is um, having all of our correspondences with our rep from InfoSnap and we will pass that information. One of the benefits of having attorneys on the board of education. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Moving on to uh, item 10, curriculum, uh, Mrs. Adams. Ten point one as a supplemental book for language arts grade ten. It's Gallows Hill, and it will be on re, um, display in our office until April twenty seventh um, before your next um, before the next meeting for your approval. Ten point two is a supplemental book for language arts grade seven. Start something that matters. It will also be on review in the curriculum department until the next board meeting. Items ten point three, supplemental book for grades three through seven. And this is Case Closed, Nine Mysteries Unlocked by Modern Science to increase our nonfiction text. It will be on display until April 27th. Item 10.4 is a new adoption for English Language Arts K-6. We recommend that the board approve the following adoptions for English Language Arts K-6. It's a scholastic guided reading, scholastic core clicks, scholastic short reads, and Rigby PM. Item 10.9 is a supplemental book for English language arts. This is grade seven, I am Alala. And finally, oh, and that will also be on review and display in the central office until our next um, board meeting. Yeah. Item 10.6 is a new adoption for mathematics, K6. This is after a lot of hard work from our math course of study team. 
Um, they have decided to bring forth Eureka Math as our selection and will also be on review in our office um, throughout the month. Any questions? The, the Eureka Math, what is that? Is that it's, a, a, these are math resources, math materials that will be pretty much the backbone of our math curriculum. This, these are online resources um, that, that teachers have vetted and analyzed. We actually just got um, a review, this was a national review recently, of, um, it was talking about materials that had hit the mark with Common Core and had effectively addressed it, and Eureka came out as one of the top, top selections. So. Any other questions? Uh, moving on to item 11, uh, human resources, Ms. Carnahan. In, uh, 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 excuse me, item 11.1A, retirement, uh, we do see two teachers who are retiring here, Paula Berry and Kim Schwartz. Item B is a retirement, Karen Cochin. Item C is also a retirement um, of Joanne Simone, uh, 10 years as a cook. And um, I know you may have uh, read that a local school district or, or heard that a local school district was losing 100 teachers or so this year, or, or you know, at the end of this year. We are at this point about uh, 20. We have about 20 resignations or retirements, so, um, which is pretty similar to what we've experienced in the last couple of years. Um, item D is a resignation. E, change of assignment. Item F, which covers G, H, I, and J. Going on to G, is an, well, you would see this is an appointment in certified and classified staff. Item H, our special services appointments, and this is for the 14-15 school year. I'll give you just a moment to look through those. Item I would be the appointment of our coaches and advisors. Item J, substitute personnel. And since the board meeting in February, um, there have been some very minor increases in uh, transportation and bus routes. Um, and you know, the district, uh, it's very important to know that you know, those kind of ebb and flow as students move in or students move out. Um, so it's always little tweaks every month. Um, the staffing level at the district now stands at 780.38 FTE. Any questions? I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, number of faculty members that mm -hmm. are leaving. Um, that's primarily due to the dramatic change in STRS, Co correct? Um, there is some. Um, Part of what's driving it. Right. That. That's, yeah. There are a lot of people who are making their decisions, I think, based upon the fact that we do have significant changes in the state teacher retirement system beginning with the next school year. Um, it's just what I was going to ask. Is this then the last wave of people who would be influenced by that change or? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on, business operations. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, item 12.1 is the bid opening for the serving line renovations at Nagel Middle School. Uh, we opened bids on March 3rd for the renovations. Uh, these renovations are going to be similar to what you've seen take place at Turpin and Anderson over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, the total cost of this will be paid for out of this uh, food service balance. Uh, so the motion is to approve the recommendation to award the bid to the, uh, to the lowest bidder in the attachment is shown. And that, we did have one bidder, correct? Correct. Yeah, but you're comfortable based on your yeah. experience? We've had, over the course of my time here, we've had several projects where it's happened to replace the uh, uh, auditorium floor at Anderson, for example, uh, replace the windows at Anderson, Maddox. We had one bidder each time. Uh, so it's not unusual. Uh, we had two bidder, interested bidders. Why the second didn't bid, I, I don't know. KFI, who's going to be awarded the bid, has been involved in doing work in the project or in the district for two decades and has an it's outstanding still 20, reputation. Below your estimate too, Correct. And you've had experience with these people before yeah. in this type of project, so we're confident that this is a... Correct. Okay. KFI is the same uh, firm that did the, uh, the work on the pool ceiling at Turpin last summer. And okay. Very well done. And they actually did the same work at Anderson two summers ago. Moving on to 12.2. Uh, this is a request to advertise for bid. This is one of our bond projects. will be uh, air conditioning 
and the circulation or ventilation improvements at Sherwood. Uh, so we asked the board to give the treasurer permission to authorize the bids uh, for that bond project. The work will be done this summer. Uh, 12.3 is the bid opening for the same work over at AIR that will commence this summer again as a bond project. Uh, the motion is to approve the resolution to award the contract to low bidder as shown in the attachment. Uh, I might note this is also, I need to kind of take a step back when I was up here a month ago. This is the same project where I asked the board we had a resolution to reject all bids and because they were they exceeded 100 percent 10 percent of budget and immediately after walking away from this podium there were a lot of questions okay our first bond project now we're over budget the budget was it's apples and oranges uh, every time we've walked up here we're required to, to have a budget for a project and by law if the bids that we bring exceed 110 percent of that we can't accept them that budget really has nothing to do with the bond project it's based upon the specific work that's being done that, uh, on that project. What's interesting this time is three of the four bids are less than the low bid last time. And the low bid that we're awarding is within, it's less than 1% difference of what our budget was. So we're dead on as far as budget goes. So, I need so to say that's that. interesting. Why, why are they so high you have to reject them all and they all by, by, so by law it says if they're more than 10% above, we just can't take them. I get that. So you sent it out, and now we've got them all coming back lower. Yeah. So it, it works. Part of the <laughs> issue. <laughs> sure. yeah. Well, part part of the issue. Sure. Uh, I didn't plan on staying up here this long, but part part of the interesting thing was is last time when we opened the bids, it was on uh, President's Day. President's Day was the evening before all the snow, and people were wondering if we we're going to be opening bids that day. And we had a lot of people showing up. We had also had people who put seven, 75, put 7550 Forest Road into your Google Maps. It will take you to Summit Elementary. We had two bidders that went to Summit Elementary that day who showed up 20 minutes late. We couldn't accept their bids. One of them is the low bidder on the project that was rebid. So, you know, by, by the sheer luck of Mother Nature, we ended up coming in about thirty-two thousand dollars less than we would have last time. So that's all. Uh, that's the way it works. When you're, it's just you're the way that it yep. works. Yep. Uh, uh, the last one is twelve point four is the bid opening for the mechanical system upgrades at Nagel Middle School. This is the installation of the chiller and, and the boiler that the board awarded to uh, the contracts to purchase last time that we pre-bid or pre-purchased. So the motion is to approve the resolution to award the contract to low bidder as shown in the attachment. Any questions? Okay, with that, we have uh, items 9.1 through 12.3, 12.4 in the uh, consent agenda. We have a motion to approve. We were going to actually take 13 as well, so 13 and go all 13 as well. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. 13.1, <laughs> uh, as we um, see different tax increment financing projects come available, uh, there's a lot of, you know, complex financing and how we structure those um, uh, projects. So we've asked um, uh, Brian Seedhouse with Huntington, who uh, participated as our municipal um, advisor with the bond issue, to help us on as needed basis as things come up uh, to make sure um, to actually handle the uh, some of the structuring of any financing that we do moving forward. So uh, we're recommending the board approve the municipal advisor services agreement um, that's in the agenda. Any questions? No, but I will point out. Um, it's about the use of that it's good to have an attorney on the uh, board. I don't substitute my judgment for our legal counsel. About the only thing I ever look for is our right to terminate. Because if we've got a right to terminate, then who cares if we get into a contract and get out of it? Like, and item uh, paragraph 11 gives us a right to terminate either party for any reason with or without cause. So um, that's about the only thing I really do look for. <laughs> Okay. Well, and they, they will serve uh, at the will of the board, so they're there to protect us. So I think uh, they will serve until we tell them not to. So I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, item 13.2 is the annual district insurance. Our uh, property liability, Arizona emissions, and fleet insurance expires April 1st. Um, we, um, again, uh, with Ferry Insurance Group, uh, went to market. Um, 
little bit better uh, outlook um, than it was in 2013. 2013, the catastrophic losses um, that uh, the United States faced were over 63 billion. We were at 38 billion, so it was obviously a softening of the markets. Um, we um, had some better um, better bids. Um, one thing that the um, Liberty Mutual did on our behalf, uh, maybe on their behalf as well, but they did a full performance uh, appraisal of all of our property. Um, over the course of the last 50 years, we've continued to go up um, based on inflationary increases and the cost of steel and, and the replacement cost. Um, so their appraisal came in 22.5 million, 22 million higher than what we um, had. Of course, we have blanket coverage, which covers everything. Um, we then negotiated and, and, um, and said we'd, we'd like to, uh, in order to remain with them, um, uh, they, they accepted that $22 million um, increase in our market values at, at no cost. Um, we had no claims last year, so it was an excellent year from that standpoint. Uh, I've given you kind of the breakdown. Uh, our two main players are, are Liberty Mutual and Cincinnati Insurance, two of the, the leaders in the industry. Um, so our, our cost per uh, insurance was remain unchanged. There's some small minor changes in some of the other coverages, um, which is a little less than 1%. So we're recommending the board approve the insurance carriers per the attached summary through Barry Insurance Group uh, from April 1st, 2015 through April 1st, 2016. Any uh, questions? Moving on. And 13.3, uh, I'll quickly go through. We have donations, uh, item A, our Anderson Band Boosters were the large donor this time. Um, um, in B, we have our Statement of Board Accounts. So we have uh, three different funds that we're waiting on, some funding um, that's been um, uh, promised to us. Uh, C and D and E are our um, receipts and expenditures at this stage of the game. We're in line with where we should be um, and where we have been in the past, so I don't really see anything uh, of any concern there. Our monthly back re bank reconciliations are in F. Uh, I want to note that um, we said this, I think, last meeting, but on February 18th, we did settle with the bond sale, so we do have $103 million, which is a good thing because we're starting to spend it. Um, and so uh, that is um, the flow of that is um, that is at uh, Fifth Third Securities, and we move that over into our uh, bond account at PNC to spend that. Um, in G, we have our investment portfolio, which is our general fund investment portfolio. Um, and uh, hopefully in the next few months, you'll uh, be able to see the interest earnings that we're, we're generating. Um, in H, we have our list of amendments to the appropriations. Um, I, uh, board service fund expenses, and J, uh, approving a summer school cashier. So it's recommended the board approve this item as well as um, the items 9.1 through 13.3 as presented. Before we have a motion, any questions on the treasurer's report? I think your comment about the uh, $4,200 uh, donation by the Anderson Band Boosters just goes back to my point earlier about uh, the support that we get from our parents and parent organizations. Any other questions? Uh, we have a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda of 9.1 through 13.3. So moved. The second. Exactly. Mr. Tepfer? Uh, Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hamelgard? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Moving on to item 14, reports to the Board of Education. Uh, we'll start with the Business Advisory Committee report, Mr. Tepfer. Yeah, we, we uh, met on uh, March 9th um, and had, had a lively discussion. I think the, the topics, we had several. Um, uh, we talked you know, history about board revisions, which wasn't very exciting, but we did talk about that a little bit. Um, we did get into the insurance piece that we talked about here, uh, recap the bond financing, but really the exciting part, really, we talked about the, where we are with the facilities. Uh, we had a, a lively lacrosse discussion as we discussed what that means to us as, as, as that program continues to grow, uh, what's happening at the state level, what does that mean to us um, to accept more of that. Um, talked about uh, board policies and, and uh, having a cash reserve policy uh, that came up during our, uh, our bond um, presentations. Um, had some lively discussion on morale because that was in the paper and, and I think there's some discussions on that. Um, and we also talked about the Anthem 
breach, data security breach, and, and what that meant to us and what it means to us. Um, our next meeting is on 420. Uh, so, Randy, you were there, and we had some live discussion. And uh, like I said, there's. Uh, I appreciate the people who serve on the Business Advisory Committee meeting. This is a very much a cross section of, of people from our community. Uh, differing opinions, uh, very much diversity of thought there, but it's, I, I think it's very, very valuable. We've got some people that are really experts in various financial areas that are able to provide input and constructive criticism to uh, what's happening in, the, in our school district. Uh, and like I said, I, I really feel like they serve a very valuable function for our school district, and I appreciate uh, the work Rick puts into it as well as uh, uh, Ray Johnson uh, is always there, contributes, and uh, all the members of that uh, that committee. Uh, any questions from anybody else? Or comments? Is, it, is that at seven on the twentieth? It is. Uh, moving on, uh, Forest Hills Foundation report. Mr. Fruman. March eleventh, two thousand fifteen, was the last meeting of the board of the Forest Hills Foundation for Education. Uh, highlights. Destination and Imagination took place on March 14th. That was the uh, district competition. Uh, was hosted at Nagel Middle School. Ray Johnson was there from the crap of dawn until about 6, 7 o'clock at night. Is that right? Uh, a full sixth day of work for, for Mr. Johnson. Uh, but it was, I, I was there for just two hours. Uh, but it was, it was really neat. The place was packed. There were teams from, from all over uh, southern Ohio and northern Kentucky. Um, the foundation sponsored 22 teams. I think three moved on to regionals. Does that sound right? Three or four. Yeah. Four. Three, four. Four, thank you. Um, it's just really great and uh, lots of kids. It's just really neat to see so many people coming to Forest Hills and um, a function like that being hosted here. So it was, it was really great. Uh, March 21st was a, yet another ACT preparation uh, class, and there's another one coming up on May 20th and 22nd, one at Anderson, one at Turpin. Those are going to be full-day courses uh, taught during the school day. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're bringing in outside vendors for those programs, too, so it's, it's a little bit more than what the foundation sponsored in the past. In the past, a lot of the, the function, uh, programs have been more test-taking techniques. I think these are intended to be a little bit more substantive. Um, and if the return is, is good, I think the foundation intends to do that uh, more, more frequently. Um, the Forest Hills 5K is on May 9th. Registration is open, so everybody should sign up. Uh, and then the uh, July 11th is the uh, Forest Hills Alumni Golf Outing at Still Meadow. And then last, the foundation has partnered with, I think it was uh, one of the, uh, a group of teachers maybe, uh, that, that came up with a laptop uh, drive. The foundation is going to be kind of the, the collection point. And uh, Christine and, and others within her group are going to help us I don't know if refurbish is the right word, but at least uh, wipe them clean, clean them up, and convert them to Chromebooks so that they're readers, uh, and then redistribute it to students in the district. So, I mean, that's really great if anybody has laptops that they think they're done with. Uh, donate them to the foundation. Uh, we'll get them ready and get them back out to the students in the district that can actually use them. So it's, it looks like it's a really great program. Any questions? I, that was my first uh, time I attended something, the Destination Imagination, and that was really impressive. I went home and I told my wife it looked like organized chaos, but it was very organized. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that was kind of neat to see. Uh, next thing, next item on the agenda is a report from the Forest Hills Teachers Association. Uh, I thought Mrs. Lover was going to introduce, but it looks like uh, Mr. Farmer is going to be presenting. I'm the substitute teacher. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm John Farmer. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Air Elementary, and I've taught here in Forest Hills for 26 years now. Um, 
I teach science and math currently, and as a member of the Forest Hills Teachers Association, I am also uh, an executive committee member, and uh, I currently handle communications for the Forest Hills Teachers Association. So, um, an interesting community connection for me is I've lived here for 44 years. I've gone through all of the Forest Hills schools, and so have my children, at least as of the end of next year. Um, I'd like to recognize the Mercer staff tonight because they're here and uh, they are FHTA uh, members here of the month. So welcome Mercer. Um, <laughs> the topic that I'm here to talk to you about tonight are the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System and the uh, recent survey results that we've uh, received from uh, surveying our teachers about how that program is coming into place. So. Um, I'm, uh, one of my other hats in the district is to be a member of certain committees, and for the last two years I've been a member of the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System core team, and that's a, a group of administrators as well as teachers, and uh, we've come together with the sole purpose of trying to make a smooth transition from the pre-existing evaluation system to the new system which starts this year for Forest Hills. Um, now, in this uh, system, we, we conducted a survey to see how teachers were feeling about the, uh, the beginning of this new system. And um, so here are some of the results that we, that we got back from our teachers. Um, first of all, uh, there's, a, there's three parts to the new system. Uh, one is the pre-conference where teachers uh, meet with an administrator, talk about the lesson that's going to be evaluated and prepare uh, with, through some discussion. Uh, that follows up with the actual uh, observation that uh, is performed by an administrator uh, to monitor teachers and their progress. And then a post-conference where they discuss how the lesson went, what some of the strengths were, what are some areas to perhaps work on, and fine tune. So these are all things that take place as a part of this, um, this teacher portion of the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System. Um, so in the pre-conferencing, one of the pieces of feedback we received from teachers is that they found that they were spending a large amount of time preparing for that pre-conference, not, not preparing the lesson necessarily, but preparing the paperwork necessary in order to complete the pre-conference. Um, we had a large number of teachers respond that they, that they spent more than one hour um, just completing paperwork associated with preparing to prepare for that. Uh, that new evaluation. Um, and as far as the online site goes, the state of Ohio has a, a site for the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System where you can go and read the results of your evaluation, complete certain paperwork. Um, most teachers felt that that was a very easy system to use, uh, that it was not at all uh, difficult and user-friendly. As far as that first segment, the pre-conference, uh, the biggest feedback we received from teachers, we, we gave them the option of uh, multiple choice as well as some open responses. And the biggest open response uh, theme that we heard from teachers was um, wanting to uh, try to reduce the time consuming nature of the pre-conference paperwork as well as to make sure that there's a consistency of expectation across all uh, nine of our buildings, which for anything is, is our, one of our big challenges. Um, as far as the walkthroughs go, teachers have uh, administrators walk through uh, and they can spend 10 to 20 minutes observing a teacher. They don't necessarily announce it, they just come in, sit down, see what's going on and then meet with that teacher to talk about those results. Lots of positives about this. I think teachers would much rather you just walk in, see what's going on and talk about it than to go through that formal uh, process which is new this year. Um, so. Um, as far as uh, other thoughts, there were some final thoughts that uh, teachers shared and what came up over and over again was that they appreciated the administrator-teacher relationships that were being made from uh, going through the process. As much as starting a new process like this is challenging, they were very gratified uh, over and over again, teachers mentioned that they felt that it gave them an opportunity to uh, establish a, a new and better relationship with their building administrator or the administrator that was uh, evaluating them. So, um, in closing, I just want to say that the Forest Hills Teachers Association, our mission is to 
uh, achieve excellence for children through unity of purpose, and we welcome opportunities to further that mission within and beyond the Forest Hills community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Moving on to item 14.4, legislative liaison report. Uh, Mr. Brinkman, or Representative Brinkman, covered uh, the issues that I was going to talk about uh, as far as legislative uh, earlier in our meeting. And so the only other thing is I'll be attending the OSBA a legislative conference on Wednesday in Columbus, where I'll have an opportunity to get a lot more information about what's going on on all these issues and have a chance to meet with some of the legislators and hopefully come back with more information on where schools, uh, public schools stand in the, in the whole process. Um, item 14.5, Policy Committee Report. Uh, Ms. Bissinger. Thank you. Uh, the Policy Committee meeting met on uh, Monday, March 16th. Uh, present was our NEOLA rep, Randy, uh, Dallas, Rick was there for a while, and me. And most of the um, things we discussed are revisions that were required by law, but the one policy that is, <coughs> let me go down, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the list there's a new one um, that says authorization to make electronic fund transfers, we're already doing that, but now we have uh, a more formal policy. But the very last policy uh, that we talked about was the Forest Hills Cash Balance Reserve Policy, and that was as a result of uh, the bond rating process we just went through when uh, our team was in Chicago. There was a suggestion that we have a cash reserve policy. So Rick and his group authored one at the request of, of the, the committee and of Dallas. And uh, it's before you now. So we felt good about that. That's all I have. Any questions? This is the first reading, so we've got the month to digest. And uh, uh, if you have any issues, I would say uh, either Dr. to Mrs. Bissinger or uh, Dr. Jackson. Or actually, if the cast balance, it would be uh, Mr. Jeffer. Uh, moving on, uh, safety committee. Uh, again, Mrs. Bissinger. Okay, uh, we met on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, and John Eckert was all decked out in green because he, every which way in his family is, is Irish, so that was a festive way to start the meeting. Um, I'll touch on the highlights, and forgive me as I read my kind of scrappy notes. Um, John started out by talking about the submissions to the state that we make as a district. Uh, there's an emergency management plan and a building map that were previously required, but now there are two new additions of an emergency contact sheet and a site plan, so we're complying with that. Um, Ray uh, reported on business operations. There have been a number of meetings for after prom with the um, fire and rescue group. Uh, Ray talked a little bit about destination imagination. He said there were about a thousand students last week at Nagel. Uh, spring inspections are going on in the schools currently. Uh, Leah. Beck talked for Saga. Uh, she and Karen Schwarmberger have been at all the spring sports meetings. Uh, they are doing letters to juniors and seniors. Um, the elementary kids actually <coughs> write really cute letters to the juniors and seniors about prom and how they want them to be safe. And they're still doing that. And she also, Lee also talked about that the heroin epidemic is also in, in Anderson Township. Steve Sievers spoke for Anderson Township. Uh, he stated there are three entities that can close roads, the city, the township, and the state. And sometimes there dif there's difficulty with each entity speaking with the other. So he talked about the challenges uh, of uh, road closings due to flooding. Uh, there are, I think now, but it may be in the works, I'm not sure, flashers on Alnetta and Beacon. Uh, the Five Mile and Beachmont construction to improve, uh, it's a continuous, as I understand, it's a continuous flow intersection that they're going to build, and that will begin this summer. Chris Wolfer, our district nurse, talked about uh, CPR certification. Uh, 19 paraprofessionals were uh, trained. All buildings are now certified. And there is a house bill that um, uh, mandates dis uh, diabetes training. We will have all of our volunteers trained by the beginning of next school year. I'm almost done. Um, we are now uh, in the Navigate program, and I think the board has gotten uh, either brochures or something in, uh, a couple times in our, in our packets. 
Uh, it's better ways for us to communicate with emergency services. Uh, safety plans are not uh, public records, but it's a communications tool. The 911 operator, if, if the 911 operator is called, the 911 operator has immediate access to building contact information, floor plans of buildings, and there's also real-time camera potential. Um, there are emergency binders with contact lists and floor plans. Uh, teachers themselves will have emergency, emergency flip charts uh, on their phones, and uh, there will be messages will be able to be relayed through the app. Uh, what else? Betsy talked a little bit about mass incident preparation. Betsy and John are working with Hamilton County and uh, our fire department's setting up command structures and Betsy said there is great collaboration going on. And then finally, um, SSOE, uh, Joe, was there talking about what we're doing with the bond issue and he mentioned the following, uh, security vestibules, uh, exterior door security, camera locations and installations, uh, better traffic flow patterns, um, access throughout the schools, and uh, Alice, we're looking at uh, lockdown capabilities. So it was a good meeting as always, and um, I continue to enjoy serving on that committee. Thank you. Any questions? I, I have a question, uh, John. I've been, I've been getting some feedback that the fire department has changed how they may view what we can do for after proms. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, any feedback on that, or is it I think Ray could probably, and he's had been in a few more meetings, but there are some procedural things that uh, they were looking at, right? Yeah, I've had uh, several long discussions and meetings with the fire department. Basically, there were cha changes in the fire code that Anderson Township adopted in 2012 with the fly specifically. And I also talked to the State Fire Marshal's office yesterday and coincidentally talked to the State Fire Marshal today who I actually went to high school with. Um, and basically what Anderson Township is doing is adhering to, to that code. And there's a little wiggle room. And there was some there was some wiggle room granted in years past. So we, we've had that I had that discussion with both after prompt you met for a couple of hours one Thursday evening a couple of weeks ago and had a very open Good conversation about it, so I think we left it. What I'm hearing, it has to do with the amount of paper they can use. Is that what it is? Correct. I mean, and fire code is very specific. Uh, in Rick, I mean, it says that they can only use, they can only cover 20% of the walls in a room, for example. And it's not, you know, 20% on one wall. It means it's code's very specific. And there's some latitude given in years past. It really is not any latitude. Yeah, about 80%. It was unfortunate they found out when they did, but to, to Rick's credit, Rick didn't really know what was happening necessarily before. And he said that there was a, potentially a variance that could be uh, uh, requested. So I talked to Assistant State Fire Marshal, I think his name's Alan Smith. Very, very helpful. We had a great conversation. He said there really is no room to put grand variance uh, based upon the way the code is written. And the bottom line is, is that there's personal liability that the fire local fire inspector takes on if he doesn't adhere to that code. So that's not anything anybody would want to want to take. So we're, we're you know we've worked through that and we're, we're, we're moving forward. Isn't there some uh, when we complete the upgrades that we haven't planned for our buildings? Well, I thought the uh, sprinkler system doesn't impact it. Does not change it. any of that. No, and that's uh, that. That was a misnomer as well, uh, because again, what you're doing is you're adding flammable material. Okay. So uh, the code is very specific with that, particularly as it relates to schools. So who makes the code? Pardon? Who made the code? State of Ohio. Actually, it's a national fire. It's, code. it's, it's national. adopted by the state of Ohio. Adopted by the state of Ohio. It was adopted by Anderson Township in April 2012. So I got the whole lowdown. So while while Ray is is doing all that, uh, as many of you know, my wife was one of the chairs for the Turpin after prom for I don't know about a hundred years. <laughs> um, only to have retired last year, but still on everybody's telephone and email lists. And suddenly I became the legal advisor to the after prom and I had to research the fire code and 
I mean, they just there's no room for wiggle and while while Ray and it's not just here. I mean I found the same thing going on throughout the country. It's that same twenty percent limitation. And you can get a variance, but good luck getting a variance. And even if you could, the insurance companies you you can't you just can't get your insurance is good, not gonna allow you to get a variance. So it just yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't work. And I, I it really, really worries me about um, what's going to happen in Apple Prom in the future, but frankly, these people that have been doing this after prom are so stinking creative, they'll find a way. I don't know what it is, but they will. They'll find a way to make it work because they always do. Yeah, the the great thing but about at, the great thing about after prom is at Turpin and Anderson, it, it's the, the schools are transformed such that you don't even realize you're in school. If the kids realize they're in school, still, I mean, they, they know they're in school, but if it doesn't seem like they're at a different place, I, I think the draw is going to be a lot less. And I know Anderson, I, 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 I know Turpin has in the past too, I've had some serious discussions about taking it somewhere else, but then, you know, the, the safety considerations of having it controlled in our district are sacrificed. So it's, it's, it's. Well, the neat thing is, I mean, just in my time here, we've not had any issue of any student. I mean, the only issue we've had in, over the 12 years I've been here is we had a student get a little carried away in one of the inflatables of one of the high schools. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and that's the worst thing that happens in 12 years. It's been a great 12 years. So, um, you know, the code is what it is. And there, there's no room for variance. And, you know, like I said, Rick was in a, a tough position on that. So, uh, you know, else I see we've been taking on by the by their own rules and personal responsibility for that. And that's not anything that we wanted to get to, to have to do. So. Well, I, I hope that there's a creative solution because I firmly believe that over the years after prom has saved at least one life in Forest Hills, having been somebody who's attended a prom before we had after prom and remember what goes on and see what goes on in other school district. I, I hope there's a way to keep this, and Julie, just as you pointed out, so that it is interesting and fun and attractive so kids will want to attend, because I absolutely believe that has saved lives over the years. I'm seeing the principals nodding. Yeah, okay. Yeah, except mine, I'm driving home at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think just to, in defense of the women and men who do after prom, there's just such pride in the work that they do. I mean, and so the new for us, like every couple of years, the chairs change. These poor chairs are like, oh great, we're the year that we screwed after prom. You know, I mean, that's how much they believe in what they're in. When the kids walk in, the, the eye factor that they get from teenagers, which all of us who have had teenagers, you just do not get very often. They just, that's what they work for, that their kid walks up and goes, wow. This is what you did for us. It's just huge. But as much time as they've been in our building already, I'm agreeing with Jim. The creativity is going to be through the roof. They're there every day already. Um, just, you know, with the wheel. So well, we're all supporting them. And I know they, that they appreciate what Bray is doing, you know, just at least trying to fight their, their points. But they, they know everybody's on their page. They, I, they get it. I think they're just kind of a little bit heartbroken that, you know, you know, because they felt like it was always safe, I mean, and all of that. And, and they it was just a don't bit, want it off It was tougher right. this year because they found out about the changes so late. Um, both schools, and, and they've been working, they work, start working on this like the night after, after prom. They start meeting and putting it together already. It's, it's tough. They, they work really hard, and, and now they're having to change it. And it's not inexpensive. So if you support after prom, I would encourage you to, I don't know whether it's online or not, but contribute and uh, make a contribution to uh, both after prom uh, programs. Like Grace said as well, we, we do know that that code was in effect in 2012 because we had it in other things in our building that we had to adhere to on a normal daily basis. Um, and our fire department was just so part of the community. I and mean, not that these guys aren't, I'm not saying that, but they were just, they had been there for so long working with these women that there was a huge, you know, together. And, and this poor guy's kind of, <laughs> I feel bad for him. I wouldn't want the after prom committee to be. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I do real feel. Comfortable sitting <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, 
was a saga meeting canceled in March? It was canceled. It was canceled, okay. So I assume there's no report. Uh, with that, uh, we will move on to item 15, executive session. Pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code section 121.22 G2, I hereby move that the board adjourn to executive session for the purpose of considering the purchase of property for public purposes since disclosure at this time would give an unfair competitive or bargaining advantage to persons who personal private interest is adverse to the general public interest. Second. Mr. Tupper. Mr. Amelgarn. Yes. Mr. Fruman. Yes. Mrs. Bissinger. Yes. Dr. Ice. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Um, I will say that no action is expected when we come back out of executive session and I would like to remind everybody that the next regular meeting of the Forest Hills School District Board of Education will be April 27th. Have a safe spring break. I couldn't remember what word to say.